So just want to get my thoughts out about this uh, Bitcoin ABC or Bitcoin Cash. Uh, I guess they're one and the same. It's it's so damn confusing. It, it, it really is. Because you're having basically a company called Bitmain that owns uh, not only pretty much is the biggest manufacturer of the ASIC mining machines for Bitcoin. It's, it is the biggest one. Uh, it's, and the most reputable one out there. Uh, it has the mining, it's building mining, it also has exchanges, and it also um, does a few other businesses within the Bitcoin space, primarily based out of China. And they are, in essence, forking August 1st because they don't want SegWit and raising the block size to eight megabytes. Now they're aligned with other companies or groups or mining groups, if you will, within this space to to put and propagate this fork, if you will, the Bitcoin, and is causing a lot of contention in the space. And I, I don't know how I want I feel about it because I don't think the fork is, as many people are saying, is going to damage the reputation of Bitcoin or having two coins out there is going to confuse people. I, I don't think that's the case. Um, you know, I, I'm a Do Dogecoin supporter, so I'm all for all coins out there. I, reputable all coins, I should say, ones that have some, some kind of soundness to them. And when I started my, my series of Bitcoin episodes about the block size debate, you know, the Bitcoin is a messy bitch, basically. Uh, I initially had planned when I started this out in May, I initially had planned out like seven episodes. I thought it would cover pretty much all the space about the miners, about the exchanges, about the different proposals. This is before Sega 2X came and popped into the scene. And at the time, there was just these very few small proposals. Uh, Segwit, while it was baked into the code already, BIP 141 by the Bitcoin Core, it wasn't activated by the miners. And there was all this contention. And just kind of break it down instead of in episodes. And then as more and more research I did, I realized I had to break all of this down into smaller, smaller par parts until eventually I'm almost 30 episodes in discussing the Bitcoin block size debate, breaking down the various um, aspects and defining, you know, what SegWit is, uh, the various different forms of SegWit, BIP91, BIP141, BIP148, SegWit2x, which was a new proposal, talked about the first proposal, the Hong Kong Agreement, uh, what exchanges are, what their purpose is in the space, uh, miners, things of that nature, just kind of break it down. I'll have a link in the show notes to the episodes that I do have out there. And then this Bitcoin ABC came into, into existence. And the other thing is the Segwit 2X, you know, this month, you know, all these different, you know, activation of BIP91 and then activation of BIP41 and now we're going to have Segwit. And it's, it's just taxing, really. I mean, we've been discussing how to scale Bitcoin for almost three, almost four years, really, if you think about it. Like 2013 is when some serious, you know, legwork was being done about scaling Bitcoin and you start getting work on Lightning Network, which is an add-on to the Bitcoin protocol, another layer, if you will. And eventually I will eventually discuss that, but it might be a month or two before I discuss Lightning Network, just so I can start talking about other things, because there's other things happening in the space. but. This block size debate, this these proposals, this uh, forking, if you will, that's going to happen. It's just, it's been so overwhelming in this space. And kind of get back to the heart of the matter about Bitcoin ABC, Bitcoin slash Bitcoin Cash. The principle behind it that they're they're doing, I think, economically speaking, about the whole raising the block size and keeping things on chain, there there is enough of the people within the Bitcoin populace that want that, they seek that, they want that, they don't want to, they may want these add-ons, but they also want to have the ability to do on-chain if they choose to. They want, uh, I think really what it comes down to with some of these people, just from the readings that I have done and the research I've done, is that they want the option, they want the choice, if you will, to be able to choose to do on-chain or um, these off-chain or second layer protocols, if you will, um, as an option for them, as a choice. And they don't want to be pushed off of the on-chain as in, as in the case with, um, as looking like with SegWit at first, and then eventually there'll be like a hard fork supposedly back, you know, all the way out in November. Um, and it has to do with like mining fees and um, 
you know, being able to do small transactions, micro transactions, if you will, you know, five, ten, fifteen, twenty dollar transactions at a very small nominal rate and not this one to five dollars that was that was going on. And some of that has to do with this thing which I will eventually discuss about the Moby Dick, if you will, that was spamming the network for almost two years to kind of push the um, push the kind of push either the Bitcoin core developers or pushing the community as a whole to actually do something about scaling. And again, all this is just extremely messy and there's conspiracy theories. There's all these different people have all these different interests and it's very political, which is fine. You know, um, Bitcoin in itself, I think people kind of forget is very political. I mean, creating a, a monetary system that doesn't come from any kind of centralized authority is a political or revolutionary idea. It's an economic policy that's never, ever been successful or has ever occurred to this extent in human history. It just hasn't. It's always been some kind of centralized authority that pushed out the, the monetary system, whether it be a banking cartel, a government uh, uh, entity or even a, a, a religious entity or a, a intersexuals of any of these three kind of groups. But now you're having individuals pushing out a monetary policy or a group of individuals, which is the case with the Bitcoin community. And uh, going to eight megabytes, I think, is far too large right now for what they, anyone can really do, particularly if it's coming out of China. And getting across the uh, the Great China Firewall, if you will, to propagate and have all the nodes and the miners being able to mine. You know, they're not offering so many blocks, if you will, by doing that because they're you know they're racing to get that mining reward and building out the chain. And if you if it's so large, which is eight megabytes right now, is kind of very large right now. Um, if that were to occur, then you're going to have a lot of orphan blocks and you're going to have a lot of miners or any miners that participate are going to do all this excess energy, all this excess uh, work, if you will, in order to get to the mining reward and may not be able to get to the mining reward because someone's already done it and they don't know that someone's already done it so they can move to the next block. And that's a bit of a problem. Also, even though there was a release of the code, if you will, I believe it was released yesterday. Ugh. Again, it's a, it's a whole mess. You know, this is kind of why I just started, started this series of episodes, Bitcoin is a Messy Bitch. But what I wanted to talk about, I think what's kind of missing is that I, I think it's necessary for right now within the Bitcoin community, if there is going to fork, now would be the time to do forks. Because you would, you would want to do a fork when they were 10 or 15 years or 20 years into this, have a contentious core, uh, fork or malicious uh, fork. Um, and I do think um, from reviewing the information I have, um, looking at um, both sides of the issue, people against it, people that are for it, people that are making the proposals, I wouldn't say all the different sides of you, all the information out there. I do think this is a bit of a, a malicious forking, if you will. And I'll eventually kind of break down with it. I do think it's going to be successful. I think people underestimate um, the infrastructure, the economic infrastructure within China when it comes to um, their monetary policy within China in and of itself, how this may in fact be, as some people have dubbed it, the Chinese Bitcoin. Um, I think people forget that in China, mobile payments is a thing there and has been for a while now, almost five to seven years with WeChat and the consistent and um, constant integration with WeChat. So there is a culture there to have mobile payments versus here out in the West where it's just really beginning. Yeah, you have Vimo, you have PayPal. PayPal's been around for almost two decades now. It started out like in the early aughts. So it's almost reaching 20 years that PayPal's been in existence. Uh, Vimo's been around for maybe about five years and there's other similar uh, type plans out there where it's integrated with, you know, Facebook and things like that and even Facebook's getting into some integration where you can load up your credit card and maybe there might be some kind of Facebook payment options and stuff like that. Everyone's doing it. Snapchat has like Snapcash. Uh, things like that are happening within the Western space. And then you have, you know, um, Kenya with M-Pesa, which um, 
when was it like 2007 really is when m pesa came into existence where the the minutes um became a, a currency if you will their you know mobile minutes became currency which eventually turned into m pesa and there's a whole uh integration there within the eastern portion of the continent of africa where people utilize m pesa and it's spreading throughout the continent of Africa, the, through the telecoms there with M-Pesa. So you have that, you, so you have the existence of the idea of mobile payments existing there. And I think what will eventually happen with Bitcoin ABC, because it's a Chinese-based company, because it's a Chinese-created uh, currency, if you will, that you will see uh, Bitcoin ABC or BCCC or whatever their acronym is going to be, will eventually be integrated within the Chinese economy. And that's going to be a big boost for that particular coin because as a billion people uh, many of them are already utilizing mobile payments as it is and now they're going to be utilizing a cryptocurrency if you will a cryptocurrency that might have a a tacit um nod if you will from the chinese government um, another thing that people don't factor in is that uh, the chinese government still has an overall hand in their economy um, it's this weird controlled not controlled system that they have going on there and with the crackdowns that have happened already with the exchanges and even with the bitcoin mining um i think that's maybe that's why some of it is happening why some of this is happening at the same time if you think about it if you are a big enough company or corporation like Bitmain, then having something like a, your own cryptocurrency, your own viable coin out there that you, in essence, pretty much control, if you will. You have the most of the hashing power. You have a say in the code. You may even have the wallets and the miners and even the businesses lined up for it. Um, is a boon for them as a business. This is something that you know the banking cartels are trying to do this is something other businesses are attempting to do out here at west but haven't been so far very successful in creating a block private blockchain and even some extent uh governments are attempting to do this i believe it was what taiwan or malaysia may have pegged their currency to the ethereum blockchain i'm not sure which country did it but there was a recent country that did that a couple months back pegging their currency to the ethereum blockchain tokenizing it if you will so these are things that are um are going to happen and will happen i just don't think anyone expected it to happen this soon and i think that it's happening with the bitcoin abc i also i do think it's a bit of malicious because they're building off the, the work uh eight nine to nine years work of i think that there is a um being able to build off of that, having pretty much a good chunk of your work already done, again, is a boon for them, but malicious in the sense that it's not done with good intentions. They're saying one thing, but it's really something else. It's really basically creating a government slash corporate coin versus a decentralized monetary system that's built for the individual. But at the same time, I don't believe this will break Bitcoin. Um, this is what I'm saying. Like, this is now the time to have these type of malicious, malicious attacks. These are this is the time now for Bitcoin to go through this. So that way, when we seek to be the global monetary system, we have all our ducks in a row. We've been through all the trials and tribulations. We've been through all these various attacks on the system, and people will be able to trust it. They will see and look back through the history of the coin. They can look through all the bad actors, all the bad actions, and how the community as a whole and the infrastructure as a whole has been resilient to that and has endured. Because if you look at you know the global crash that occurred between the period of really 2006 is really when it started, but you know I think the history date is like 2007 to 2010 is the official history timeline of the global economic crash that that happened. You can see that all these different all the bad actions that the the current economic structure is doing and of course no one got away you know everyone got away with it no one went to jail over it and all the bad actions that they happened and the result of that and how many people still feel powerless that's why they went into cryptocurrencies that they have no control over their financial wealth and that they they cannot trust the governmental institutions to respond in a reasonable fair manner when it comes to 
financial policies and financial actions is a obviously a clearly very extremely crony capitalist corrupt system um, but I do think that by going through this and enduring through this going through this fire that Bitcoin will be stronger for it we're gonna have to start knuckling down uh, on all these different you know avenues that we have in existence um, strengthening our the mining capacity maybe diversifying it and building mining operations outside the sphere of china and maybe biting the bullet if you think in the sense of the return on the investment for the sole purpose of making sure that the network in itself is strengthened um, i always have been a belief that mining shouldn't be um yes you can make money but mining shouldn't be the only means of you making money i think mining my belief is this um when it comes to mining, my, my thought about this, and I've been thinking about it for the last three months about it, trying to refine this thought, and I think it boils down to this. Um, everyone knows about media, particularly the old media, like the print media, radio, television, that old form of media. And just basically, because I'm, I'm American, so from basically based on the premise of the American states, how it's operated here in the States, you had you know, ABC, NBC, and CBS. And they were publicly broadcasted television channels here in the States. And they were pretty much the only ones for the longest time. Yeah, you had PBFs and some very local stuff throughout the states. But for the longest time before cable came into existence, that was it. But they all had news organizations. And news organizations in general, even with papers existing, New York Times, Washington Times, all those different ones, uh, for the most part, particularly in television, were money lost. You, you weren't making money, ad revenue, for the most part, in the space for news. But they were global. They went to all the different places. They covered different wars. They did all these investigative reports. They did all these things because the thinking on the level of the, the corporations at the time that owned it was that they felt it was their responsibility to do these news organizations. And two, it was okay, it was a money loss because it was a, a social good, if you will, to have a very sound, very strong, very fair to some extent news organization. You needed to report the news. It was important for freedom of speech. It was important for the social good of the community, both locally, nationally, statewide, to have a sound news organization. And it was a pride. It was a jewel. It was a thing that they can say, um, whether for stock purposes or for social purposes, to say they have this crown jewel, this crown jewel of, uh, of a, a news organization that does all this good work, if you will, does all this good reporting. And it was okay for them to lose money on it because their primary driving force, the primary money of the, they were making money, wasn't news. It was entertainment. So they used their entertainment to finance and fund news organizations. And I think maybe perhaps we should think along those lines when it comes to running uh, the nodes and mining that it's a social good for the network to have these type of operations, whether it's uh, you're mining individually or mine, well, for Bitcoin, you probably can't mine individually, but mining, the mining pools may be a bit smaller, but having a mining operation, uh, running a node, it's good for the social good because it's good for the, the overall health of the network. By having or running a node, it's a sense of social pride as an individual, but for the community as a whole. And what you're doing within the community itself for Bitcoin is you make your money from other things. You make your money because you, you sell hats or you are a consultant or you, uh, you know, build the code. Um, you build the miners themselves, uh, the chips. Uh, you accept it as a merchant for your goods and services that you have and you make your profit and money for that way and you just keep this mining operation as a social good or running that node for a social good and you kind of keep it you know basic to where you're not running in the what's that the red or whatever it's so overwhelming that you can't actually run it you're not economically sound or whatever but you make your wealth built off of bitcoin built off the bit Bitcoin as a whole, the token, the, the monetary system in itself, and not necessarily focus so hard on a return of investment um, or what you're getting out of running a node. You're doing it for um, because you're a Bitcoiner, because you're part of this system, and it's important. It's, it's your crown jewel that if you run a series of nodes or you run um, a Bitcoin mining uh, little organization or a little network, if you will, um, little warehouse if you will 
And because he do that, the, the network in itself is strengthened. The network in itself exists. It has, it's, it's the built-in security that comes from mining um, is still sound, it's diversified, it's all over the place. You're in you know, Venezuela, you're in uh, Argentina, you're in, Niger in Nairobi or Nigeria, you're in Kenya, uh, you're in England, you're in Russia. And you do this because you're, you're part of the community. And because you have this business, you can say, hey, I sell these hats, I sell these um, you know, computers, I sell these mining, mining devices, but I also run a, a mining operation, or I also run all these nodes, or I build these different products for this space so that um, I can receive coins that way. And my return investment on mining is not important to me. What is important to me is that I'm part of this community, and so thus I run this mining operation, or thus I run these nodes. And I think this is, we have to re, really reevaluate and take the opportunity to rethink how um, as a community we have constructed ourselves. Um, there are some positive attributes that we can, we can glean from what is happening now and build off of and still strengthen the community, still move forward, still be here 20, 30, 40, 50, or 100 years from now. And a lot of it also has to do with we have to kind of shed the 20th century thinking of financial systems and, and really look and analyze that Bitcoin is a 21st century financial system. And we have to come up with the new terms and new concepts and new adventures and new ideas of how to engage and interact in this financial system. And maybe we need to reevaluate what return investment is, what that actually looks like, what that actually means within the uh, cryptocurrency system. It might mean something completely different now. Look at what Bitcoin is. Like from the early beginnings of Bitcoin, where it was like pennies or ten cents or a dollar, and now it's trading for three thousand dollars. The token in itself, the the Bitcoin itself, has increased in value. And yes, it goes up and down. I think it's trading last time I looked was like twenty five hundred or something like that. And it may go down a little bit further because of this mess, but low two thousand. But it's never going to be nothing. It's never going to be nothing. It still always retains some sense of value. And I think what we have to think about, in, in a sense, if you're a trade, if you're a trader, maybe that return the investment, you know, selling it at three thousand when you bought it at uh, two thousand, you got a return investment of a thousand dollars. You know, that might work for that particular individual or series of individuals to do that. But overall, for the health of the the community, that shouldn't be the driving factor of you know selling the coin or trading the coin out for other coins or something like that. It should be building off to where yes, it can be a stored value for long term like savings but overall utility is something that we really need to really focus on i think we got lost in the sauce if you will about you know the bitcoin proposal and the fact that the, the coin was going up is so high in value i think we we lost the emphasis on utility of the coin in itself i mean if you look at ethereum without yeah there's ico madness or even dash to some extent or even litecoin which has activated segwit we have to look at what type of utility that we're building off of as a community that people will want to participate they want to build off they can see they know that they can get x value overall for everything off of this particular uh, coin not just simply individual financial freedom but the freedom that comes with it you know the ability to be able to you know pay their bills or set some aside and know that they actually have some kind of saving that's not going to be squandered or taken away. Um, being able to build off their businesses, if you will, and, and being able to be successful in their business because they, the income that they're receiving, the value they're receiving, that they may never have been able to re receive value before, they can with cryptocurrency. You know, projects like yours just attempt to do that where you can get your media contact monetized. Uh, Steam is doing that now uh, with a Steam token. Um, you know, Pure Tax, uh, Alexandra, there's all the different types of, you know, on the media and attempting to monetize that type of system so people can have value for the content they create. Uh, merchants have been in existence from kind of sort of the very beginning. Silk Road, whether you like it or not, was a merchant provider. Granted, the goods that were sold there uh, were not lawful or legal in many countries, uh, but that's actually changing in of itself. That type of uh, monetary value where you'd be able to get the types of goods and services that you want um, at a whim in an entertain, almost near instantaneous fashion um, is essential and important. 
um, also how maybe refining or changing the nature of capitalism in and of itself, uh, the raising of funds that are coming through Ethereum, the ability for people that actually have sound projects, they actually can get finance now because uh, venture capitalists didn't see the actual value because it wasn't instantaneous value. It's actually value that might not come into like five, ten years. So now you can do like this very like long-term thinking when it comes to value, where you can actually wait and have some understanding or assurance that the value you've put in, you're going to get out of, um, which you don't necessarily get quite so much anymore. Maybe initially in the stock markets and when companies first formed or stuff like that, you may have gotten some sense of that for some corporations or some uh, companies. But that's really, um, really changed. People want that instant return on investment so fast, so quick. Um, that's why there's so many companies that kind of crash and burn all the time in Silicon Valley, which is where a lot of capital is being spent right now. Um, but now, I think with the ICO moment with Ethereum, even though there's a lot of technology stuff being built, I think you're going to start seeing a lot of manufacturing or other types of businesses being built that not necessarily don't fit within that tech sphere. Uh, you might get back to like you know you know thanks to 3D printing, you might actually get back into investment of in robotics. You might get back into investing in actual manufacturing where there wasn't really that strong a return investment because you had to have so much capital to invest in order to make it work and now you can do you can raise that capital but maybe you can do it at a smaller scale and then build up into that to that bigger capital wealth you can actually have a proof of concept or a proof of product and be able to shop your company um, like you never could before and that's why I think I really, for me, with this whole Bitcoin ABC slash Bitcoin cash thing boils down to, is that we just need to reevaluate our concepts of economics, our concept of community, and our concept going forward of what we want from the cryptocurrency space, what we want from Bitcoin in itself. Um, I kind of discuss it in one of my episodes where I discuss, you know, when it comes to consensus, the kind of downsides of it is that there's a uh, battle within Bitcoin in itself. You know, is it a stored value or is it a digital cash? And we're seeing the kind of the results of that because that wasn't really defined early on. It was kind of left vague because when Satoshi Nakamoto wrote his paper, he kind of addressed both. And maybe that was a mistake. Maybe he should have picked one or the other or he thought we could do both. I personally think we are capable of doing both, but maybe. Um, it comes down to um, what is done on paper and what is actually in reality when you put it out in the world is completely two different things that maybe it can only be one or the other and right now those are the kind of summing up those are the kind of the three things is one what is Bitcoin is it stored value is it digital cash two Uh, we'll we'll endure this this particular hard fork. Now is the time to have it so that we can be stronger as a community, um, as a new economic platform. To have this type of attack, we we will survive this. We can go forward. And three, reevaluating you know three reevaluating and rethinking of the overall community and economic structure economic structure of. Uh, Bitcoin and start building more utility into the system so Bitcoin can reach that mainstream level. So that's it. That's my thoughts. Thank you for listening and to the moon.